Welcome to a novel talk. I'm Wendy Kendall, a cozy mystery and middle grade mystery writer, and half of the duo bringing you our regular podcast series, talking with fascinating novelists writing across a variety of genres. And here is your co-host, Carl Lee. Thank you, Wendy. I am Carl Lee. Uh, I write paranormal fantasy, so you know I'm excited to... uh, excited about our guest this episode. That's for sure. Joining us today for a novel talk is Jerry Westerson. She is a true genre jumper, consistently creative and entertaining author. What an incredible number and variety of novels. She's the author of 12 Crispin Guest Medieval Noir Novels, a series nominated for 13 national awards. She has a paranormal romance series and the last in this exciting series is expected to release in October this year. I can't wait. She's also authored historical novels, LGBT mysteries, an upcoming steampunk series and short stories. She's a former two term president for the Southern California chapter of Mystery Writers of America, and also an office holder for the Los Angeles chapter of Sisters in Crime and Orange County chapter of Sisters in Crime. She frequently guest lectures on medieval history at Southern California colleges and museums. What ho! Welcome to a novel talk, Jerry Westerson. Well, thank you for having me today. Well, Jerry, I want to jump right in uh, and talk about your paranormal romance series. Uh, I write paranormal fantasy. I love, love paranormal. Um, I love the action scenes um, where you have magic crossbows flying through the air and loading themselves. Um, how do you make all of that seem so realistic when you're reading it? it you're not in a situation where you're like, well, how, did, how would that even work? You know, it's very realistic in a fantasy sort of way (laughs) you're gonna have to believe your own writing i mean uh uh what if it's all about what if isn't it i mean that's what Mm -hmm. authors always say what if this stuff really works you know how would it work and um how handy would that be you just raise your hand and the crossbow comes from wherever it comes from and slaps into your hand all all loaded with the right kind of bolt and, and ready to fire at the strange creatures coming at you. So it's all about just uh, imagining the thing being real and working properly. And, you know, you've, you've got it all figured out in your mind of how the magic works. And, and um, that's, that's, all there, that's all there is to it. Simple. <laughs> Excellent. I love simple answers like that. <laughs> I don't believe it's simple for a minute. It is skillful. (laughs) Well, Jerry, in The Darkest Gateway, that's the fourth book in your paranormal romance series, Kylie is torn as to accept the challenge before her that could cost her the highest of high price in her life if she fails. Can you talk about what motivates and What is it that Kylie debates over whether to cross that threshold on such a treacherous adventure? Well, you know, the, through the, the four books, um, the four books happen in in just one month. So everything encompasses four weeks. So, uh, this thing happens to her. Basically she, she opens this book, the book of the hidden. She, she never knew about it before, never never heard of it. She finds it in this this uh, house that she buys to become her tea shop and living quarters in Maine. She moves all the way from California to move there. And she's she's remodeling, breaking breaks into the wall, finds this book, and naturally, as anybody would, takes it out, opens it up, but then this starts this entire cycle that's been going on for thousands of years. And what it does is release all of these evil creatures into the world, and it becomes her job to put them all back. Now, it didn't take her very long to realize that 
this is a suicide mission that you know she was kind of hopeful at first that it that it she might she might make it um all the chosen hosts before her that's what what she's called as soon as you open the book you're the chosen host all of them before her died pretty nasty deaths either from the creatures or from uh, the guardian of the book the demon guardian of the book erasmus star and uh and he eats their souls uh, and that's how he kills them and uh, they've only lasted a week or a week and a half at the most she's hanging on for four weeks here and she's gradually becoming closer more at one with the book itself getting dragged into it and she she realizes that okay uh, this is this has got to stop and it's got to stop with me because if when I die it's just gonna go into this stasis and somebody else is gonna open it some century and come into the same problem so she kind of knows that that she's she's got the gumption she's got the chutzpah that she's gonna put it into it and so yeah she's she's got a perilous journey ahead of her in this book wow I just found her to be such an amazing uh, personality and yeah taking that making that decision um, was really fascinating to read about and then of course going on the adventure with her <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that was fun yeah there were a lot of people on the adventure uh with her um when you're creating these scenes how do you keep everyone straight where everyone is what they're doing so it doesn't seem like just you know people popping up out of nowhere when they when they are needed and then they go back in their little broom closet until they're needed the next into time. their holes <laughs> um this the fourth book uh, is different from the other ones all the others are are strictly first person in her point of view the fourth one because of the nature of the story it had to be split up into different points of view which was kind of fun too mm -hmm. um it, it's like it, you're just a movie director i mean i always write cinematically i always write <laughs> With the intention that somebody will produce these someday, but I, I see it that way anyway. That I'm the director, the lighting director, the costumer, you know, the makeup, the special effects person, uh, and all the actors. And you just, you just, everybody gets their chance to shine in the light, and then they have to move aside and do their own thing. And hopefully, uh, it's written in a way where you don't think that they're waiting in the wings for their next. View, that they're actually doing something during the time that somebody else has the point of view. Um, you know, that's how all books should be written anyway. Um, as soon as, you know, you have to assume the characters have a life before you open the cover and will continue to have that life once you close it at the end. Well, so these characters matter. certainly did. Well, great. <laughs> <laughs> and I've accomplished it, you know. Perfect. That is such an interesting perspective from writing. And um, just to say, as a reader, um, as a reader, when I was reading it, it did feel so visual to me. So now I can see why it would, because of the approach you take in your writing. That's fascinating. Um, Jerry, why did you choose to set your paranormal romance in Moody Bog? For me, I really enjoyed this setting. As a cozy mystery writer myself, it makes me think of cozy settings where neighbors know each other's business and suspicions, except in your case, characters and suspects include zombies and other such beings. So what's special about Moody Bog? And the tea, everybody has tea. Um, <laughs> It's uh, it's it's actually more of a suburban fantasy than an urban fantasy. Um, it does sort of start out like as if it's a cozy, you know. It's almost like that, except for the the language and the sex, uh, <laughs> and a little bit of the horror. But um, it's uh, you know, Moody Bog. I made up that name. That there is no such place as Moody Bog. So don't go looking for it. Um, first thing I did, of course, because I'm so used to research by writing my medieval mysteries, and I, and I like to keep things, I mean, when you're talking about zombies and things like that, I still like to be as accurate as I can to whatever those things are. 
So Moody Bog, um, I got a book on place names of Maine. And that's where I started. And uh, I was looking up, you know, what can I call this place? And uh, there were a lot of place names where they had the word bog in it. So I'm, I'm guessing there's a lot of bogs in Maine. <laughs> and, um, and there was also the name Moody, because uh, there's a lot of place names obviously named after people who founded those particular areas or had a farm, something like that. But they weren't together. There was no Moody with a bog. So I thought, okay, um, I, like, I like the sound of it. It's a little comical, you know, Moody bog. I love it. Um, but it also, that book was very helpful in giving me names of characters because then I could use them as authentic surnames for people who live in the Ebon. Oh. So that's, that's very handy. But yeah, I like the sort of, because um, there's a lot of humor in these books. I mean, it's, it's yes. not scariness. Yes. There's a lot of humor. And, you know, I wanted that in the story. So that, you know, Moody Bog kind of, kind of clues you in and it's not all seriousness even though there are very dire circumstances <laughs> yes definitely <laughs> speaking of dire circumstances where did you get the idea to have a romance between kylie and Aram aramis aramis erasmus erasmus um their their romance is so entertaining um between between the fact that he's a demon and has very little clue of human emotion, and but also their touching protective nature toward one another. Well, that you know, when I decided I wanted a romance in it, and it was so it became more paranormal romance and urban fantasy, and and that's sort of the definition. There can be a romance in an urban fantasy, but it's not the driving force of the story, and in the paranormal romance. That is. I mean, like, uh, if you remember Twilight, uh, yeah, there's vampires and werewolves, but it's essentially about the romance between Bella and Edward. So, uh, you know, if that wasn't there, then you really wouldn't have that particular plot. So so it is the driving force of the story, and I, I love Erasmus. He's so grumpy and grouchy. <laughs> And uh, unlike, there's another demon that shows up, and her name is Shabiri, but she's she's been around the whole time, all these thousands of years. She's to me, she's sort of a combination of Joan Collins and and the care and the person Hillary on Love It or Listed. If you've ever seen that show, <laughs> she's very snarky and, um, and very catty, and she understands all sorts of cultural references. So she's she's good at. At being snarky like that, but Erasmus is only awake for a week or two weeks every couple hundred years or so, so he doesn't have a chance to catch up on human reactions, human emotions. He so he doesn't understand any of it, and he certainly doesn't understand falling in love, and so that's all fun stuff to write. Just there and read. They go after each other. <laughs> Jerry, what are some of the challenges in blending genres of romance and paranormal? Well, I, I don't think there's many challenges because it is a, a firm genre. Uh, so you just basically sort of follow what others have been doing in it. Um, but, you know, I, I always like to have a little touch of romance in all my books. Um, this one is really, you know, going all out as part of the story. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't think it was too many. You don't want to be, you don't want to be too, um, in, in the style that I'm writing, I didn't want to be too erotic, so not too graphic. Yes. Um, and, and you know, not clinical about it. <laughs> yes, yeah. You know, this and then that happened and then this happened. It's, it's more romantic, so, you know, it, we're not uh, fading to black, but we, you know, we're, we're not, we're just being more lyrical about it. Um, and, and it's fun to, you have a romantic moment that gets interrupted by a zombie slamming into the door. I mean, you know, <laughs> just things like that happening. So, you know, just your typical Normal stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Saturday night, you know, we call that a <laughs> 
So you mentioned the other demon, and uh, you defined her as snarky. But you have a talent for snarky dialogue. And I was just wondering, does that come out in your first draft, or do you develop it through revision? <laughs> no, I'm naturally snarky. So it's pretty easy to come out. Excellent. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's nothing more fun for me than to write an argument scene or a snark scene. And usually... Usually it's the villain being really snarky, and uh, so they get to 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 wheel off some pretty pretty nasty but funny lines sometimes. Excellent. Um, and an argument, of course, is great because um, <laughs> for, for some reason, <laughs> and I'm really good at coming up with those, and uh, and it, and it makes for a dramatic moment too. It makes for conflict, and and uh, there's nothing better than writing that. Well, at one point, Kylie poses the question, perhaps love was stronger than fate. As an author, what interests you about exploring that theme? Well, that's universal, isn't it? I mean, love conquers all, uh, no matter what. I mean, she is fated, she was fated to open this book. She didn't know it. She was fated to be a chosen host and die. Um, and didn't know that, but you know, because you know, this is a little spoiler if you haven't read the first book. Uh oh. Uh, she starts, you know, she is attracted, obviously attracted to Erasmus Dark, and and um, and they do eventually fall in love with each other, and and can can he fight his nature and not kill her? <laughs> Not kill the woman he's fallen in love with and wow. eat her soul like he's supposed to. Um, and she, you know, she is fated for this, but because of love, you know, it's a happy, you can have a happy ending out of it. But um, not that there is one. We don't know. <laughs> not a total spoiler. spoiler. No, no. <laughs> we don't want to give anything away. Oh, no. But, there's um, a lot to yeah. this. Yes, there's a lot of layers, and it's uh, there is definitely a lot of fun coming up with all of them. <laughs> and one of those layers is the scene where um, Kylie dupes Satan into uh, um, giving her her way. Um, and I found I found that I I found that both surprising and inevitable at the same time. And I've only ever read that in writing books that the out the outcome of an individual scene should always be surprising yet inevitable. And I'd never really grasped that concept until I read that scene in this book. How did you manage that? <laughs> Cause I'm well, going to steal for, it. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> it, you know, yeah, you want it to be inevitable that I knew from the beginning that I was going to write that scene. And so I was looking forward to writing that. And, uh, but I didn't know quite what that would be. I didn't know what she would be using to, to, uh, get her, her leg over there. <laughs> so, um, but that came after just thinking about it, uh, and, and writing along, getting into the second book. Um, and then I realized that I'm going to have to make sure that I have all the clues in the first book first. So it's always something that sort of that's casual. It seems casual at the time. Everybody's taking it for granted. You're reminded of it uh, along the way, so you're not cheating the reader. But it nobody pays attention to it anymore. So that that's become so that that's why it becomes inevitable because you've been hearing about this all along. This major spoiler, so we're not going to talk about specifics. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you try to be vague. About, you've been hearing about it, so when when it happens, you're, you you think, oh, I oh yeah, that was great. <laughs> so yes, that's, that's exactly how I responded when I read that. It was great. Yes. <laughs> so, how did you develop your magic system for this uh, series? Uh, is it is it based on something, or is it just you grab? Uh, you said you like to research, so was it just grabbing specifics from various um, mythos and just slapping it together? <laughs> well, when I when I 
because I'm an Anglophile, I, I used a lot of the, the creatures are mostly um, from Celtic origins. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I kind of was keeping it there because I figured, well, that makes sense. They came over with the Mayflower and all, you know, they, they came over, well, earlier than that, but they've been coming over for a while. So it's okay that they're in America. Um, but because they travel through the plains, you know. Um, but once you start writing, um, because you do have a lot of different ideas, and, 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 and there's a point where you say, well, look, these all have to come together in some way, so you make a, a rule, you know. This can happen, but that can't. Um, because otherwise, you wave a magic wand, and it's all, it's a two-page book. Uh, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, you just, as you're developing the story, and all the characters, and what has to happen... It, you come to realize that there's that, that you create your system that you know it's not hard to figure out it's not hard to understand the system um, so um, yeah I mean it's just basically as you come become conscious of what has to happen that's when the system blossoms excellent Jerry I'm wondering, would you treat us and our listeners to a reading from your Book of the Hidden Paranormal series? Oh, I would be very happy to. Yes. Uh, this is uh, from The Darkest Gateway, and it is uh, a scene where Kylie encounters one of the many creatures. And it's it's one of my favorite. This is a real it's a real creature. It's not a real creature, but it is a, a creature from mythology or you know the Celtic mythology. And uh, it, he is a headless horseman, and he's called the Dullahan. And he he is he's he doesn't have his head on his neck, but he carries it under his arm, <laughs> and it's it's rotting away, which is kind of gross. Oh. But he also has he has a, a spine, a human spine. For a whip. Now, who wouldn't Whoa. want to to read about that? So, <laughs> so here we go. <clears throat> this is Kylie, of course. <clears throat> I moved to the very edge of the road and waited. The sound grew louder. It couldn't be anything else except hoofbeats. They clopped, not on a gallop, but in a leisurely canter. And soon, there was the Doolahan coming around the curve... His head looked even greener and slimier under his arm than it had before, if that were possible. His weirdly roving eyes spotted me easily. He kicked his red-eyed horse's sides and hurried toward us. All the while, he swung that spine whip. With each revolution around his headless neck, the weapon grew longer and longer. I kept the spear close to my side. I didn't want that whip to catch it the way it had gotten the crossbow the last time. He almost he was almost upon me when he shrieked, Kylie Strange! That doesn't work on me, you idiot, I yelled. The face frowned under his arm. It cast its googly eyes toward Erasmus and opened his mouth to yell his name. He's a demon, remember? We've been through this before. Boy, you sure have a short memory. Must be because your brain is decaying faster than the rest of you. <laughs> Looks like a bad case of melting Roquefort you got there. His dead face either grimaced or really was melting. Then I don't need to say your name, he said in a high screechy voice. He spun the whip. Before I could get out of the way, it came at me and wrapped around my body, trapping my arms at my sides. I barely got out a yell before I was yanked off my feet. The horse started galloping, and I was flung out behind it almost parallel to the road. I couldn't bring up the spear. I was whipping around in the air and getting a little seasick, but it was better than being dragged behind on the asphalt. There, was, there wouldn't have been much left of me after that. The bones of the spine whip were digging sharply into my side. I tried wriggling free. If Headless decided to fling me off a cliff, there wasn't much I could do about it. I knew Erasmus must be around somewhere, but this was up to me to figure out if I could. The Doolahan galloped around a sharp curve, and I was thrown and dragged through the limbs of pine trees shouldering the road. Damn it, I yelled, spitting out pine needles. I am so going to kill you. 
He lifted his head up with his other arm. It swiveled and glared at me. Not if I kill you first, Mistress Strange. No need to be so formal, I grunted, struggling. I slammed into some holly bushes and ow! The face cackled and turned away, tucked back under his arm again. Then I looked up and saw what he was cackling about. The next curve of the road didn't have any nice prickly holly bushes or spiky pine boughs. It was just granite all the way up the rock face. Shit! <laughs> thank, you for sh- thank you for sharing that. I enjoyed that scene when I read the book as well. Okay. Um, so what, what's next in your uh, little bag of tricks? What, what can we look forward to in the upcoming months? Oh, well, uh, at the same time that this is released, um, I've had a historical uh, fantasy steampunk book uh, brewing, and it's going to be released, too. It's a first of a trilogy called The Demon Device. So that will be coming out the same time in October. And uh, and I'm going to have the most fabulous um, release party. It is going to be at an historic home the Chafee Garcia house in uh, Rancho Cucamonga. Everybody's invited to come. Wow. And um, they have a, the same night, they have their Sleepy Hollow event. It's October 19th. And they, they do the, they reenact scenes from the story of the legend of Sleepy Hollow all through this house. You, you pay, of course, to take these tours. It helps support the, the uh, historic home. And, uh, and at the end of the evening, there is the headless horseman. So uh, that's oh exciting. wow! So that's fun, and I will be there with my books and come and and have them signed. That sounds great. Thank you so much for the reading, too, Jerry. It just—it's so amazing how even though that was an action scene, you really get a feel for Kylie's personality. I mean, that's really such skillful writing. I love it. <laughs> Yelling at a got headless guy with a, with a green face, I guess. That's, <laughs> what are you going to do? What can you do? You just make it humorous, I guess. That was great. Thank you so much for joining us for a novel talk. And before we say goodbye, I want to encourage our listeners again to visit your website. Um, there's a website, bookofthehidden.com where book has an E on the end, bookofthehidden.com, and also jerrywesterson.com. Yep, that will be the place where you can find out about uh, the demon device. Great. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you to our listeners for joining us, Carl Lee and Wendy Kendall, for a novel talk. Remember to subscribe so you won't miss an episode, and keep reading because a novel read leads to a novel talk.